welcome to Money Matters. Vegetarianism or plant-based diets are increasingly popular because of a desire for healthy living triggered in part by the COVID-19 pandemic. Zelichin reports on different types of meat substitutes and whether they're nutritious and safe for consumers. It's lunchtime on Monday. Customers are scarfing down their meals at this restaurant in Shirwan. They eat noodles, burgers, and fish and chips. But this is not an ordinary restaurant. It serves only vegetarian food. These colleagues just finished their meal. It's Raymond Yu's third visit in six months. I normally eat a lot of meat. I want to have um, a change. I know eating too much meat is no good to health. That's the reason why I come here. At another table, Kimberly Poon eats vegetarian curry pork with rice. If you go to a Chinese restaurant, you cannot order this kind of vegetarian food in Chinese food, a traditional restaurant. I think this is quite good and quite new style. We decided to be a one-stop hub, so dining and shopping. David Young started the restaurant and grocery store chain in 2012. With an eye on the market potential, David's team of food scientists spent two years creating pork made from plant ingredients, what's known as plant-based pork. In Asia, pork is the most consumed animal protein. Uh, in China, for example, 65% of meat consumed is pork. So uh, for us to develop a plant-based meat alternative, um, it was kind of a very natural conclusion that we would start with pork. This smells very good. What is this? <laughs> well, this is our vegan luncheon meats. So how do you make this luncheon meat? It's not pork. Soy, beetroot, uh, wheat, and also coconut oil. Those are the main ingredients. Now, of course, how to make it exactly a luncheon meat taste that requires on formulation and our IP. It's and as salty as a regular luncheon meat. <laughs> I guess that's a signature of luncheon meat. So it's always kind of the balance of saltiness and just taste profile overall whenever we develop a product. David, how did you decide to make luncheon meat? Well, it's always the items or the food that we crave most in our market and are high consume, high demand. And at the same time, which are the ones that people feel most guilty about, that they would like to have a replacement or an upgrade. So luncheon meat happens to be at the center of both. The new product was launched last year, and it sold to fast food chains in Hong Kong and China. Over the past 18 months, David's company announced multiple partnerships with food and beverage groups to serve his plant-based pork. They are also getting a lot of requests, whether it's a coffee shop or a you know burger chain, etc. And a lot more, even meat eaters are also saying that, hey, you know, we like something like this. Um, it is another option for them. Last September, David's company raised 70 million US dollars from global investors to accelerate growth. In addition to our existing uh, plant in Thailand, which we are also boosting capacity, we'll also be building another manufacturing site in mainland China for mostly the China markets. Uh, in addition, we will invest heavily in R&D, we'll invest heavily in our global distribution network. Currently, products are sold in more than 10 markets, and the outlets are in three cities. Felix Wong is a food and nutrition analyst. He says the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated consumers' interest in plant-based diets. There were news about animal hosts carrying pathogens and hence infecting humans. So more and more consumers are associating plant-based options with healthier positioning. Meanwhile, um, I think at home eating is increasing. Uh, and of course, there is some disruption of the meat supply chain. The market for meat substitute products in Hong Kong is currently worth about 30 million US dollars and it's projected to grow to 38 million US dollars by 2025. That's only a fraction of the conventional meat market in Hong Kong, which is projected to be 1.3 billion US dollars in 2025.
Over the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park in Sha Tin, another type of meat substitute is being made. What's known as lab-grown meat. This startup grows fish from fish cells. The chief scientist explains it starts with taking muscle tissue from the fish meat. We put it into a uh, nutritional broth, which contain uh, all the uh, nutrients that they need. For example, amino acid, vitamins, glucose, and minerals. And basically, we, we take a tube into this uh, centrifuge, and then we uh, spin down all the cells, collect the cells to, uh, uh, to the bottom, and then we can uh, put it into the incubator and let them grow. After three weeks of growing in the incubator, this fish fillet is ready to be cooked. First, dip it in soy milk. Then add breadcrumbs, and finally fry it in oil. And now for the taste test. Oh, it looks just like a fish fillet. Mm. That's good. Yeah, if you didn't tell me it was uh, cell grown, I wouldn't have known. Bon appetit. It tastes oh. good. Yeah, it's very moist. I think it's the tartar sauce that makes it really good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's matched perfectly with the purpose yeah. cabbage smell. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well done. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Day cook. You can do this at night in your lab stuff during the day. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> the cost of raw materials to make one lab grown fish fillet is about 15 US dollars versus 20 US dollars per kilogram for conventional fish fillet. While the technology can be used for many different types of meats, Mario and his partner Carrie Chan chose to focus on fish when they started the company in 2018. Roughly about 60% of the seafood and fish is actually consumed in Asia. And so we reckon that is a lot of opportunity and also it is where we've been consuming a lot of the resources from the ocean. So far, they've raised about 4 million US dollars in funding that we are going um, beyond the uh, early stage of R&D and going on to start to our uh, scale up and also ramping up to our pilot production. And Carrie wants to develop partnerships with consumer products companies. Uh, so we can supply to them our cultured meat, fish meat, or the cultured fish fillet, and then the rest of the, like, the breading, the seasoning, and also the, the, the cooking or the frying, and then frozen and package it as a consumer product will be done by the, by the food brand that we collaborate with. As this type of food production is quite new, Carrie wants a stamp of approval from the authorities for her lab-grown fish before selling it general consumers, when it comes to new technology, they will have a higher level of confidence uh, when there is a third party, independent party, who do the vetting process. So I think that with the government approval, it will definitely boost the, um, the level of confidence on the part of the consumers to try these uh, new tech products. Hong Kong doesn't have a specific ordinance or law for lab-grown meats. In an email, the Center for Food Safety writes, developers of cultured meat should ensure that the cultured meat products are safe for human consumption. Kerry is applying for regulatory approval in Singapore. It created a regulatory framework in 2019 to ensure that novel foods such as lab-grown meat fulfill the city's food safety standards before being sold. These assessments cover potential food safety risks such as toxicity, allergenicity, safety of its production method, and dietary exposure arising from consumption. Last year, for the first time globally, Singapore approved lab-grown chicken made by American startup Eat Just. Now with this first case approved, I think it sent a very, very clear signal to the general audience, investors and company. That means that there's more certain route to the market and revenue. Dr. Jimmy Louie is a nutrition academic and conducts research with Hong Kong Center for Food Safety. After examining the nutritional information of the lab-grown chicken, he says it's as nutritious as conventional chicken. The protein contained in the cell-grown chicken should be what we call the complete protein, which contains all the essential amino acids for health, except that the concentration of total protein is lower compared with the conventional chicken. You need to eat more of that to get the same amount of protein. As for the vegetarian luncheon meat, it's made from plant-based ingredients, so it's safe for consumption. 
So, Professor Louie, is this a plant-based lunch and meat nutrition? It's not very different from the traditional lunch and meat in that it is still quite high in saturated fat and sodium. It smells um, quite good, so it's bad for me, I think. <laughs> it smells quite good. It smells <laughs> like the real thing. <laughs> While the meat substitutes are nutritionally similar to the originals, they won't completely replace the real thing anytime soon. We see the presence of meat and other alternative sources of protein parallel to each other, or sometimes even complementary. Some consumers are really inclined to the meaty taste of meat, and this is like actually one uh, the very important factor of why meat has been persisting in like thousands of years in food history. Coming up on Money Matters, a quiet green and sandy refuge, 25 minutes from Central. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Money Matters. Nestled off the northeast coast of Lantau, the small leafy island of Pengchao offers an affordable option for those who enjoy lounging on a quiet beach or being surrounded by greenery. Reporter Alice Khan took a boat trip to check out some properties for those curious to see what's on offer. In this episode, we are zooming into properties on the small island of Pingchao. Pingchao is located off the northeast coast of Lantau Island, as an area of 0.99 square kilometers. Although Pingchao means flat island in Cantonese, it does have one modest peak in the form of 95 meter tall Finger Hill. Very little has been written or recorded about Pingchao's history. It is likely that its first residents were the fishermen whose boats sheltered in its bay while their owners dried and mended their nets on the shores. Vivian Wong is a teacher, works in Kowloon Tong and lives on the hill. Vivian, well, is it your place? Yes, this is the garden that we had. It's almost approximately 15,000 square feet already. Alice, let me tell you, this is one of our tree. This is a mango tree. I can only grow these kind of fruit trees in this area. If we are living in the city, we get no chance to do the same thing. Vivian, her parents, brother, and a dog used to live in an 800 square foot flat in Lychee Kok six years ago. They planned to buy a bigger flat in the city, but the prices were too high. It's almost about 10 million. Uh, at that time. So uh, that's why we were looking around and we finally came to Ping Chao and we met an owner. He offers us around 500,000 for such a bigger place. Apart from the garden, they also bought this 900 square foot two-story house, which they renovated. What sort of changes did you make to the layouts? So in the old days, it was just like a very small and narrow door. And this side is the concrete. Uh, the problem before is too dark. That is why we decided to make the sliding door. The living room and the dining room are on the ground floor. The bedrooms are on the second floor. Vivian says the island used to be very quiet. Now she has noticed more houses being built. Once you walk out the door, you can have beaches, you can swim, you can play other uh, water sports, you can go hiking. Currently, about 2,500 private residential units are on the island. 70% are village houses, and 30% are in the public housing estates. Some developers also build houses along the seashore. Rents range from $27 to $33 a square foot. They've gone up by 1.6% over the past year. The property prices range from $8,200 to around $10,000 a square foot. They're 3% higher in the last year. Agents say rents and prices are still cheaper than those in the city. During the last 10 years, the property market in Hong, in Hong Kong maybe go up a lot. So some people are looking for 
you know, the pace, affordable or uh, certain price to buy the house. So that's why a lot of people buy properties here. Dickie Tan plans to buy a flat here. Pingxiao is really um, environmental friendly. Also, uh, bigger flats, uh, lower in pricing, so it's pretty attractive to me. What is his budget? My budget is a little bit limited, around 3 to 3.5 million. Another home seeker, Phoebe Lee, also has her eye on buying a home here. Pingxiao is a fewer people, so it is a best point. I want to see the beach. Her budget is $2.8 million to $3.2 million. So we hunted for some properties which fit their budget and requirements. First stop is a ground floor flat in this 43-year-old village house that is only a five-minute walk from the pier. It is a 280-square-foot studio flat. Asking rent is $8,500. And the owner also wants to sell it at $3.5 million. This is a really special location of the house in front of the sea and the beach. And then also in this area, the arability is not too much. Maybe just once a year for, for sale, for rentals. The original design of the window was smaller, but the owner turned it into a sliding window. This is just a sliding window. Once you open the window, you can feel the air breeze, you know, from the sea. It's quite, you know, the ventilation is quite good. And also because the size of window, so that a lot of lighting can get into the flat. So that you can see that flat is quite bright. So it saves a lot of energy. As it is a studio flat, this large window created a privacy issue. You can put it back here and then have some screen so that you can have some perfect areas here. David says a semi-transparent blind can also solve the problem. The interior would need updating. The interior of the kitchen and the toilet are also not renovated. But the flat may lure those who love the beach. Is it very close to the beach? It's really, really close. I think 10 seconds, you can just go to the beach and then you can, you always walk on the sea, maybe you know, 30, 30 seconds. Next stop is another flat in this house on the other side of Pingchao. It's also facing the sea, but far away from the pier. This is also a studio flat. The size is slightly bigger, 300 square feet. The owner is asking $3.3 million, cheaper than the other one. The windows are small and the structure takes up some space. David, what's that? Oh, this is a staircase. Because you know the building is called three stories, but you can use the stair the area here underneath the staircase as a storage. Did the owner redo the whole place? Yes, he did. He did work from the scratch and then we moved the, all the all the paint of the wall and then we painted. And also originally the tile was a mosaic four. And now he replaced the little tiles. So, and, and also here you can see that the all the sockets here are new. And here you can see the AC is also new. The owner also altered the layout. Usually the old village house, the toilet and the kitchen is really, really small. They just squeeze together. But the landlord, actually he combined the, the toilet area and the kitchen area as a whole toilet area. The owner will also include new electrical appliances to attract buyers. The owner spent over 300,000 to, to run away this whole flat. Actually, the buyer just needs to buy a house. They don't need to spend money to decorate the unit. Dickie and Phoebe checked out both flats. After viewing, which one does Dickie prefer? I would prefer this one uh, than the other one. Um, in regard of the pricing, it's like 10% lower. The size is slightly bigger than the other one. The windows is a little bit smaller. The other one got a really big windows, but a lot of tourists pass by and it's too close to the beach. Here is newer. I love the kitchens, the toilet. Compared with the other flats, um, the toilet is a little bit old. Uh, I found the furnishing, the walls, painting is a little bit damaged as well. What about Phoebe's verdict? The first one I prefer. 
it's near the ferry station, and I like the near the beach. And I like the big window, natural light. And when the not good thing is the bathroom is too old. This bathroom is better because it's new. I'm not prefer this because it cannot give me natural light. Bo think prices on the island are higher than they expected. David says the owners could reduce the price by around 5% to the right buyers. But he admits the sales market has slowed down amid the pandemic and economic uncertainty. Five years ago, we may have like 20, 30 transactions per month. But now, for the last two years, the transaction number is about 5 to 10. People still want to look at the properties, but they would have some hesitation. Because maybe, I guess, the people, they may be not sure about the economical condition in the future. Britain Jason Crisp owns a cleaning company on Ping Chow. He is now renting a house along the seashore. Jason plans to buy a brand new flat for an investment. It's a very stable market in Ping Chow. So I think it's, if you're wanting to make a huge profit on a property, I don't think Ping Chow is the place for that. But certainly, I think it's, it's a safer investment. I don't think you're going to have great losses like you could have elsewhere. Jason takes his family out to the sea once a week. Peng Chao office is lovely. It's very nice. You know, there's, there's lots of um, cultural buildings here, the temples, um, the lifestyle. Peng Chao has a few coffee shops, a small Chinese restaurant, there's one big supermarket and some small vegetable stalls in the narrow streets. It doesn't have cinemas or big shopping arcades, but it has some quiet streets offering shops that sell arts and crafts. Commuters rely solely on the ferry service that takes 25 minutes to sail to Central. There are no vehicles on the island. Residents usually walk or cycle. In the future, market watchers think Land Tell Tomorrow Vision would benefit Ping Chow development. But Vincent Jung says a positive impact would not be immediate. Quite a lot of the developers, they do have some land banks on Ping Chow because they also see that there may be some uh, future upsides uh, of this development. But uh, the upside that we are talking about may be two decades or three decades. That's the show. Thanks for watching. Next time on Money Matters, a global shortage of computer chips has caused supply chains to stall, hitting the makers of cars and electronics, anything that relies on these diminutive but essential components. How long will this problem last? See you then. Good night.